Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we'll talk about how the child uh, welfare services have been affected by the pandemic with guests. Tara Perry, CEO of National Casa Gal, the Association for Children. Uh, Barnaby Murph, CEO of Extraordinary Families in Los Angeles. And Larry Ryan, President and CEO of ChildNet in Florida. So thank you all for joining us from your uh, various locations. Children and youth are some of the most vulnerable members of our society, and you represent children and youth before the court. So if you could just describe the work that you do and the settings in which you operate, um, I think that would do a great deal to, to get us kicked off. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So again, I'm Tara Perry. I'm the CEO of the National CASA GAL Association for Children. Um, we are a national movement of 950 local programs and state organizations across the country. We operate in 49 states. Uh, the one state that we are not operating in is North Dakota. We serve um, over 270,000 children that have experienced neglect or abuse that are mostly in the foster care system. And we serve those children through volunteer advocacy. We have a network of 93,000 volunteer advocates that are uh, a part of or sworn in uh, and authorized to operate through court systems across the country. And those volunteers work with youth that have experienced this trauma, neglect and abuse, and they are advocating for their best interests. They are they're getting um, close to uh, the families, they're understanding the dynamics and the situation and the lives of those children. They're working with school systems, they're working with teachers, they're working with um, medical providers, they're working with community leaders to really understand the situation in which uh, the abuse and neglect uh, occurred, but also um, looking for solutions so those children can be um, reunified with their families if they are removed. If they're not removed, we work with families to strengthen that um, safety net for those families. Um, and when they are removed, and if reunification is not an option, then we are looking to uh, ensure permanency, uh, living relationships with, uh, or living arrangements with their families, or arrangements with um, um, other uh, kin um, or close family, uh, uh, not necessarily uh, fictive kin, I would say, and uh, if that's not possible, then it is um, adoption. We want children to have a safe and loving home. And that is the outcome that we look for uh, for those children. So you're, you're talking about the expertise of being a person who cares. Yes. Who observes life. But this isn't something that you're going to necessarily acquire through a particular schooling or a yes. particular profession. Yes. Right? This really goes to the heart of just being a person, being an American who cares about other children who are like you, perhaps of a different race, perhaps of a different background, perhaps of a different circumstance, but we're using as adults, we're being a family, right? We're yes. being a family in the United States. So Barnaby, your, your organization is a downstream organization from that first identification of a child that might have a need, and then you take it from there. Could, could you talk a, a little bit about what, how you face this uh, issue from your perspective um, over in Los Angeles? Sure, yeah, so um, we work directly with the County of Los Angeles um, who has identified children who are at risk, um, who have suffered abuse, neglect, and have been removed from their homes. So what we do is recruit train and all importantly support the foster parents who are taking care of those children um, and to, until such a time as their families of origin can um, be reunified with them. Um, as Tara said, if that can't happen, then our families are open to adopting the children um, and providing that permanency, love and support throughout their lives. 
So um, we are really a, a, a first responder and a, and a safety net for kids who, who don't have other people in their lives who can take care of them once they've been separated from their families. Um, we've been around for about 25 plus years, um, as I said, serving LA County and supporting the children and the families who care for them. Could you give us a little bit of an overview of the scale of your operations? How many foster uh, care parents are there in your network? Uh, how sure. Many, uh, um, what your budget is? Sure. We um, are considered a smaller organization in that we have about 22 people on staff, but um, a larger sort of piece of the puzzle. We have about 135 foster parents on our roster. Um, we serve about 200 children a year. Um, you asked about our budget. We have a budget of about three and a half million. Um, we also have a, a program that serves youth who are aging out of the system, 16 to 26 year olds, and providing support and resources and services for those youth as they try and transition to adulthood and self-sufficiency. So one of the things that we love talking about on this show are the different elements of a continuum. Larry, your organization falls between in scale, uh, Casa Gal, National Casa Gal and uh, Barnaby's organization. Could you talk about how things are going in Florida and, and, and how your operation uh, functions? Sure, I'd love to. And you're right, we're, we're sort of in between um, in scale. Child that technically in Florida statute, we are the lead agency for community-based care. Um, and we serve that function both in Broward County, the Fort Lauderdale area, and in Palm Beach County, um, the area of West Palm Beach and the town of Palm Beach and, and, and the Glades. Um, what we do is we actually manage the entire foster care system in both of those counties. So we are contracted by the state of Florida, its Department of Children and Families, um, to do the work that they 20 years ago once did from on high in Tallahassee. Um, the model in Florida is to have organizations like ours, there are now 17 of us around the state, and we are all nonprofit organizations um, that, that craft a local system of care for foster children based on our community's local needs um, and on our local resources. So it's an incredibly interesting system. I think it's an incredibly effective system. Um, right now in between Broward and Palm Beach, we are serving about 3,400 children today. That census is a little bit lower than it's historically been, but primarily for good reasons as maybe I'll get a chance to explain. Um, and between the two communities, um, we have contracts worth about $110 million. One of the things that I find to be so interesting is that if you take your experiences, and I, I was in New York, um, and I was with the uh, Child Welfare Administration at the time, which is now called ACS, and we uh, coordinated work across all these independent nonprofit agencies. But if you take all these different organizations in different parts of the country, different politics in those different parts, different um, uh, um, uh, uh, demographics in each of those parts, you are doing a lot of things that are very, very consistent across your different functions, like right? small organization, mid-sided organization, large organization. There's really a continuum of care here. Tara, as you look at trying to partner with people like Larry, people like uh, Barnaby and, and so many others, I mean, you're talking about 270 thousand children, you're talking about 93, I guess, uh, thousand advocates. Is that what you said? Correct. Yes. Right. That so correct. you're you're partnering all over the place. So are you finding that there's a difference in how you can partner with different uh, 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 communities based in red state, blue state, uh, you know, the, the political uh, stuff? Or is that just nonsense when it comes to children and and you just serve children. Uh, it's, it's, we just serve children. And I think that's the thing that we, the three of us hold in common. Uh, we are all working uh, to ensure that children are safe uh, and children are given an opportunity uh, in life to thrive. And foster families, uh, obviously that is a huge uh, need and a, and a great intersection for our work. Our advocates work very closely with foster families to uh, again, continue to understand 
the experiences of the children uh, that the foster parents are caring for. Um, during the pandemic, obviously foster care was uh, having more foster homes uh, for children uh, was a great concern for us uh, as CASA advocates as, and as an organization. So those relationships are important. Relationships with the administration, as you talked about your past history in, in New York, we couldn't do our work. Uh, we're in close partnership with social workers uh, and we do our work in the court system so that judicial judicial support and that judicial relationship is also key um, to the work that we do. And so we're partnering with organizations like the two uh, on this panel, as well as organizations that are focused on adoption uh, and those organizations that are focused on strengthening families because we want children to uh, be with their families of origin. We believe that outcomes are better when that can happen. And I think we all work to that end. So we just finished a poll and we, we were trying to get to the primary reason that attendees felt um, uh, children suffered trauma uh, with 61% of respondents um, responding that basically it was adults, abuse and neglect by adults against children in their view. And then the second uh, most was, was lack of safety. Um, and the third was uh, physical and mental uh, health care. As you take a look at, at uh, your young people, uh, Barnaby, um, how do you view the, the solution uh, to this? Or is it just a process? Is it always going to be a fact of our life that certain children are going to uh, find themselves in need of support from people who are not their families, perhaps with the, um, with the intention of reunifying families as, as uh, Tara describes, or uh, moving to a different circumstance, independent living or adoption, if that just isn't feasible. How do you see this developing in our society and healing? Mm, that's a really big question, Mark. <laughs> um, I think I'll use a word that we've so often heard over the last few years, which is, I think it's an intersection of, of all those things. Um, Unfortunately, I think there will be children who will need assistance from outside their families of origin because of upstream issues like poverty, like lack of education, um, like domestic violence, like addiction, um, and, and those issues that are affecting adults who are, who are trying to be full and whole adults while also parenting um, is difficult. And we need to provide those, those services to people across um, all of those um, situation. So I think that children will always need help. They will always, you know, they are due to no fault of their own in the situation when we come in contact with them. And our job is just to provide everything we can um, to give them stability and safety and an opportunity to thrive. The primary goal is always to reunify them with their families if that's possible and provide those, those families um, the support that they need. You know, adoption is a it is something I think that we all um, celebrate, but we have to understand that that's a situation where one family's coming apart and another family's coming together. So um, understanding you know, both of those realms and providing the support, love, and, and really understanding and nurturance to across the spectrum, all the adults who are trying to care for these children. So you're saying basically that, that the state of our child is really a reflection of the state of our society. Right? If we have a healthy society, then children are less impacted. But when we find that so many children are impacted, we can look at that and we can say, you know, our, our, we, need, we need to work more. Um, as, as we come out of this pandemic and as we reopen schools, Larry, are you, are you anticipating some negative effects that Gardner asked the question where, um, you know, um, do we expect a, a surge in in uh, child abuse neglect reports as we turn to school or um, as, as uh, parents are out there trying to figure out how to uh, make an income. Are we seeing um, uh, an effect in your work in Florida? Um, one of the astounding things of the pandemic and its effect on child welfare in Florida is we really haven't seen an impact that everybody anticipated. Um, our numbers have essentially stayed consistent with what they were, with some exceptions. 
clearly abuse reports are down um, because with schools closed or only partially open schools are traditionally the largest reporters of child abuse. So reports are definitely down. Um, we are on the edge of getting backed up so that because of court hearings being slowed down and things of that sort, children are not necessarily moving through the system as rapidly um, as they normally would and moving to permanence as timely as we would like them. But overall, we have not seen some of the things we feared, which was a total loss of capacity in terms of being able to provide foster homes and residential care for children. Um, we've survived a couple of crises, but so far nothing that's overwhelmed the system and we thought we were gonna face that. Um, and we haven't seen a drop in you know, actual cases coming in. I think strangely enough, because there's been some advantages to the um, pandemic in terms of the way we do business. Um, ChildNet, for example, we do dependency case management in both, uh, both counties and Florida law mandates that you visit foster children once a month. Um, in the pandemic, while we may not be doing face-to-face -face visits as much as we did because the feds have given us a little bit of leeway, child that immediately, once we went to video conferencing, we began seeing children once a week. Um, and so our eyes are on the children actually more than they had been, and we're actually interacting with their caregivers more than we had been. Um, so everything's sort of balancing out in terms of those numbers. If I could take one more second, to answer a question or maybe your poll question, um, I wanna be sure people understood. I don't know if it's unique to Florida, I doubt that it is, but the single far and away indisputable reason that children enter foster care in the state of Florida is their parents, substance use and abuse. Um, at least 50% of the children that get removed, the primary reason for their removal is their parents' substance abuse and I would I would surmise that in the other 50%, at least half of them, substance abuse is part of the issue. So it's self-medication, uh, perhaps in response to trauma, perhaps because uh, people are irresponsible, uh, but it is, it is this idea of, of uh, parents no longer being capable of acting in the interest of children and, and needing some intercession. Is that correct? It is, but I would suggest that we would have across the country, we would have adequate resources to care for children who have been traumatized the way we need to, um, which is far better than we currently do, if we could get on top of adult substance abuse. We just completed a poll in which we uh, asked whether um, particular regions are dedicating enough to children in need, and 95% of the respondents said no. Now, of course, this is an audience of people who have interest in this. But you know, it, what, what really strikes me is that this is really where our tax dollars are going, right? We are, we, we are funding the government and the government, local, state, um, national government is, is funding you. Plus um, you're doing fundraising all the time in order to get some additional contributions because the government funding is, in, is simply insufficient. How do we as a society respond appropriately? Because we always hear these, these complaints about taxes and, and government and, and all these different, different aspects. And then we are constantly bombarded by solicitations. Um, I, I, it's an unfair question, Tara, but, but how, do you, how do you respond to this? Because the need is so much there. If a child is in front of us, and that child is hungry, we can see it and we can respond to it. But so often we sort of turn away when it comes to systemically responding in a way that funds these programs adequately. Thank you for that question. I may not answer your question directly, but um, I want to answer in a way uh, that is um, maybe that resonates with me a little more. I think uh, when we talk about neglect and abuse, one of the primary issues uh, I think across the country is poverty. And I think if we think about economic instability uh, and insecurities of families, um, we're gonna see more families that are um, 
disrupt it. We're going to see more children come into care. Uh, and we don't know what, what life will be like or the economy will be like after the pandemic. But when I start to hear those debates about tax dollars uh, going to uh, you know child welfare and these services, and then I start to hear uh, other conversations on, uh, and not to get political here, I'm not trying to do that, but on, you know, $15 minimum wage and, and not, you know, wanting to have a $15 minimum wage. What families do you know that could survive on a $15 minimum wage if we're just honest or where a minimum wage is now and families are suffering and during um, emergencies and, and pandemics and situations, crises like this, it's always the most vulnerable who are hit the hardest. And our attention seems to um, go to th that population last. We start to, you know, and we should know that they're gonna be the ones that are hit the hardest. So I think that um, it is a huge problem and I think the need is gonna be greater to stabilize those families. If we think about children staying with their families of origin, which is a lot less expensive if we can support those families than putting them into a system that our tax dollars are, that the government has to um, support. So that's may not be answering your question, but that's the thing that just really plays uh, over and over again in my head that I can't seem to reconcile. It's such a very good point, and it does, it does address the, the topic, not in the way the question was asked, but sometimes the better answer is to answer the, the real issue. Andrea, for example, uh, mentioned the, um, the whole issue of mental health services, right? Yes. And ad inadequate mental health services, um, which very often is tied to Larry's point with addiction, right, um, that creates downstream effects. So in a sense, by not investing in one place, we get a, a, an effect at the, uh, you know, another place. So Barnaby, you're, you're also uh, nodding. You're having that same uh, issue, right, amongst, amongst the people that you serve. Absolutely. Um, and just having also our, our youth program, um, a lot of our youth are parenting youth, and we see that these, these issues are systemic, you know, the their, some of our youth children have ended up in foster care. So we really have to be tackling these issues uh, um, ahead, of, ahead of where they come to us. Um, as Tara said, um, poverty is a huge issue. And, and with poverty comes all that other slew of conditions that bring kids into care and create the conditions that create youth who are aging out, who never found permanency, who are then repeating um, the conditions that happen to them as children. So you know, there are a lot of supports that we're doing. We, there's a lot of education that we're doing. I want to kind of give a, a positive um, element here that there, there are a lot of great minds and efforts and organizations working together like, like the three of us here today who are trying to really um, turn, that, turn that ship. And um, I would love to be worked out of business um, and, and not have to be here. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of our work is supporting the birth parents and the foster parents. Um, to give them the resources to, to help us get worked out of <laughs> business. Well, well, it's such a good point. It's something that we, we talked about all through uh, all four of us uh, uh, before the show uh, started about how do you care for the caregivers? Um, Larry, could you just talk a little bit about how you create community and how you interact with, uh, with your families, with the volunteers and, and, and so on. And Tara, if you could also jump in, um, how do you ensure that people who are trying to deal with childhood trauma, who themselves are absorbing quite a bit of trauma, it's a first responders issue. How do you ensure that their uh, needs are also being met? Well, it's, it's a really good question. And the Florida model you know, community-based care is what the foster care system in Florida is called. It is all about the relationships um, with, with organizations like Tara's um, and organizations like Barnaby's, they're, they're, they're Florida branches or Florida counterparts, but it is also about creating a sense of community among caregivers. Um, it is so child that the model is we don't necessarily recruit and support foster parents, but we subcontract with 21 different agencies that actually license, train and support foster parents. 
and and support means that they really have they create support peer support groups among their foster parents they create a community of foster parents um what foster parents look like today in the state of florida and compared to 20 years ago when we when child that started is sort of like night and day um they are incredible people but they do get incredible support from those we call them child placing agencies that recruit train, license, and continue to support them. It's child that's responsibility to do everything we can in terms of the way we reimburse them to support that and make it possible. But then they also do an incredible job, some of them, including some of our faith-based organizations of getting tremendous donations, um, tremendous fundraising. Um, I don't think, frankly, that a single one of our subcontractors that we pay them the full cost of what they do, the really good ones make it up with incredible community support and donations, which is a model I have mixed feelings about because some of them are not as skilled at fundraising as others. Well, and, and we just finished our third poll and we asked what the primary method for paying for services to children in need, 77% uh, felt that it was, uh, it was through government. Um, and then there were a, a few other uh, uh, respondents. Uh, Tara, we're gonna uh, we're coming to the end of our time, so we're gonna we're going to uh, um, uh, come to you, and then uh, Barnaby, we're gonna give you the last word. When when we take a look at at this whole uh, system, and we're talking about easy points of entry, where you can make a real contribution, but not necessarily yet the uh, commitment as a foster care parent or even more of an adoptive parent. Is the point of entry to, to uh, take our skills and place them in service to youth, is the point of entry being a Casa Gal representative, a volunteer? Thank you for that. that question, absolutely. Uh, it is a great way for anyone that has an interest in supporting children, uh, the most vulnerable of our children, um, to get involved. Uh, there's training, um, quite a bit of training. You have to have a heart for this. You have to be committed to this. Uh, you are that stable, consistent voice in the life of a child. Sometimes you're that only uh, consistent voice, um, uh, adult voice in that life. So that that is a great way to involve uh, yourselves in the child welfare system, but more importantly, it's a great way to make a difference in the lives of children. And how, how long, what kind of a commitment? Let's say yes. I would have come in, I get training, so there's a, tra there's a commitment for training, mm -hmm. and then I get my assignments. Yes, there's 30 hours of uh, training. There's an extensive uh, qualification background check uh, process, screening process um, for our volunteers. And then there's 30 hours of what we call pre-service training. Uh, and then there's an additional requirement of 12 hours of training um, annually. And then the time that you spend with the volunteer the time that you spend in the courtroom, uh, I'm sorry, the time you spend with the child, the time that you spend in the courtroom, and then the time that you spend getting to know uh, the circumstances. So it is quite a commitment and I don't shy away from that. It is, it is not for, it's not episodic. It's not something you can get into and out of. And we ask that our volunteers commit to a uh, a child and they remain with that child in that case as long as that case is a part of the system. And so it is a, it's a tough, tough uh, assignment, but I tell you, I hear this all the time. People get involved and they say, I want to make a difference in the lives of children and they end up uh, having the difference made in their own lives. So the people who serve are, be, are actually receiving. Absolutely. And, and Barnaby, you're nodding. I saw Larry, you smiling. Uh, are, are you both in, in accord with that, with that idea? Barnaby, you first and then Larry? Absolutely. Um, we are an agency who, who um, sees a lot of cases go to adoption. So we're, we have parents who um, come to us who are seeking to adopt. And, um, you know, sometimes it's not that child that they first parent whose case is going to adoption and so there will you know there will be reunifications and there's there's loss and grief with that for the for the foster parents but 
Um, you know, sometimes this can happen three or four times and it's beautiful. The child's parents, um, you know, were able to take that child and be reunified and, and continue. And that's, that's the goal. That's the primary goal, but it can be hard on the foster parents. And um, I've spoken to so many of our foster parents who do ultimately end up adopting, who say they would not have changed one thing, who, you know, every child that came into their home provided such a, a beautiful experience and that they were able to be there for them. And while some of them are so young, they might not remember it. They were there when nobody else could be there. And they impacted that child in a way that will forever be with them. It's a, it's a profoundly shifting um, sector that we're in. And um, I've been deeply moved by it and um, continue to be so. And the children who come, who I'm have the privilege of meeting, um, are just phenomenal. And I think that for me, there's this sort of um, acceptance of foster care. It's kind of a sleeper issue. We've just sort of absorbed it and, and it's in the background, but these are, these are our children. This is our community. And we do need to come together um, as a community to raise them. And, um, you know, they, they, every one of them has the ability to thrive and contribute and just be phenomenal in their communities. And sometimes I feel like that's forgotten. And I, and I wanna bring it to the front and say, there's nothing wrong with a child in foster care. It's just that their yes. conditions weren't such that they could um, be where they were and that they need every opportunity um, for that stability. And the, you know, we, we just have to come together to raise them. And Larry, you endorse that with all the different communities across Florida. Take us out. If you wanted us to remember one thing about what we can do, what we Americans can do, what is that thing that we can remember and do? Well, I'd like to see the whole paradigm, the whole view of foster care change and that, that government not think about economy and thrift and return on investment, but recognize that these are children who have been removed from their families because of traumatic conditions. And we should be focused on doing everything the best that we possibly can for all of them. We should not be trying to scrimp and save and be economical. I'd love to see the picture in view change to that. Thanks for that opportunity. <laughs> Well, you know, the, the question is, what is my return on investment in a lifetime of parenting my two children, right? We need to all adopt that for our children. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing that. Larry Ryan, um, President and CEO of ChildNet in Florida, Barnaby Murph, uh, CEO of Extraordinary Families in uh, Los Angeles and Tara Perry, CEO of National Casagal Association for Children. I hope everyone who is here uh, becomes an advocate, becomes a foster care uh, parent and advocates uh, for children. That's the nonprofit report. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you attendees. And we'll see you next Tuesday. <laughs>